So welcome everyone to the 11th in a series of free webinars hosted by the Chamber of Commerce under the theme supporting businesses in a time of crisis. I'm Will Pino, I'm the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce. Today we are partnering with the Wellness Center to provide you with expert advice on the topic, understanding the mental health of, Im uh, of impact of COVID-19. This session will focus on helping businesses and individuals understand the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic can have on employees and individuals and their families, including children. The webinar will provide important information about what happens to the brain during this challenging COVID-19 period and how you can take care of your mental health, <clears throat> excuse me, during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. To guide us through today's topic, our lead presenter, Shannon Seymour, and panelists, Felicia McField and Pauline Vander Grinton, whom I will now formally introduce. Shannon is a registered clinical psychiatrist and founding director of the Wellness Center, a comprehensive clinical practice offering a range of uh, psychological, mental health, and behavioral therapy services since 2004. She holds a master's degree in clinical psychology and after a 22 year career returned to school in 2018 to pursue her, her bucket list of, uh, I guess, a PhD. Wow. Before opening the Wellness Center, Shannon spent eight years with the Cayman Islands Government Counseling Center. And before returning to Cayman, she worked for Family Services Canada and Health Services Canadian. A believer in continued training and professional development, Shannon completed extended training specializing assessment and diagnosis of autism spectrum disorders in 2009. In 2014, she and two members of her staff became the first early start Denver model certified therapists in the Caribbean and evidence-based early intervention for young children with autism. In 2019, she completed uh, additional training at Yale Child Study Center and became the first certified space therapist a parent-focused treatment intervention for children with anxiety disorders. As she's a strong advocate for community involvement and a founding member of the Cayman Islands Crisis Center, co-founder of the Cayman Islands Psychological Association, and has served on the board of the Academy Sports Club for the past 10 years. She's a TEDx speaker and a frequent local presenter on topics of child development, autism, mental health, and reflective supervision. And in her spare time, if she has any, she enjoys running, beach walks, and CBC podcasts. So I'll also introduce Felicia McField. She's a mental health counselor and a registered play uh, therapist. She earned her master's degree in clinical mental health counseling with an additional specialization in play therapy from the University of North Texas. She is a nationally certified counselor and a licensed professional counselor in Texas. She is the first Caymanian play therapist registered with the Association for, for Play Therapy she is also locally registered with the Cayman Islands Health Practice Council for Professionals Allied with Medicine. And last but not least is Pauline Van de Grinton. Pauline Van de Grinton is a licensed mental health counselor and clinical services director and supervisor at Hope Academy. She has been working in Grand Cayman with Cayman and Education Connection since 2003. She was taught out as a sought out as a cognitive behavioral specialist for treating OCD, anxiety disorders, and impulse control disorders. She remained on the island for one year and then returned to the US in September 2004. From there, Pauline continued her work at the Center for Anxiety Disorders in Wisconsin, as well as traveling globally to meet the needs of her Cayman clients. She returned shortly after to Cayman to continue her outpatient work and was invited to be a behavioral specialist at the inception of the Hope Academy in 2009. So just some chat instructions before I turn over to Shannon. Let me remind you that you may submit questions during the presentation via the chat feature. Uh, we will also be having our usual question and answer segment at the end of the presentation. And again, we'll be taking your questions during the segment you just have to raise your hand 
at the bottom of the screen. We'll actually have you into ask you questions at the end of the presentations, but you are free to add your questions to the chat and the ladies on the call will actually go ahead and respond to your questions. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Shannon and she's gonna share her screen and uh, take us through the presentation. Take it away, Shannon. Thanks, Will. Good morning, everybody. Um, you can see my screen already, right? Yes. Yeah? Okay, perfect. So um, I was really grateful to have been asked to talk about this issue. It's certainly one that I think we're hearing a lot about. We hear a lot about sort of the mental health concerns related to the current COVID-19 pandemic. And it's something that those of us in the field have been spending a lot of time sort of talking about and trying to spread information, accurate information, factual information to the community here and, and abroad. And what I think makes this really interesting from a psychological point of view is that while we all bring collectively many, many years of experience and expertise in the field of mental health, we are also going through this pandemic at the exact same time as the people we are supporting and serving. And so that in itself is quite a unique phenomenon that I certainly have never experienced. Um, perhaps the closest maybe was Ivan supporting people who had been through something quite scary. Um, but so I think we've been constantly as a community of professionals connected to one another, supporting one another so that we can make sure that we are taking care of ourselves in order to be able to do this important work that we have this place for our expertise in the community right now. Um, and so we'll get started. Um, what we're gonna cover today is really sort of understanding from a neurological perspective, what the brain's response is to stress, how our body responds to that stress, and then also looking at what might be the difference between fear and anxiety. There's a lot of vocabulary that's going around right now in terms of stress and anxiety and worry and trauma. And we're gonna sort of tease out the meaning of those words a little bit. Um, we're gonna look at how we can support our mental health right now. And we're gonna look a little bit at how to understand what children are going through and some tips for parents. And I'm really grateful for the panelists with me because Pauline has um, extensive experience in things like anxiety and PTSD and OCD and Felicia as a play therapist really brings that additional piece of knowledge related to children. And so um, they're gonna jump in where I might miss a point or, uh, or ask a question that is salient. So the first thing that we wanna talk about is what is really happening in our brains and our body right now. I feel like I've become a, a, an infectious disease expert, all of the information that's going on. There's certainly a wealth of um, information available about public health. And I guess it's important that we also in parallel understand what's happening in our brains and our bodies right now related to the stress that is currently in our lives. And so just wanted to start with a little tiny bit of neurology. I love this stuff and could talk about this stuff for hours, but um, for the purpose of this webinar, I'll try to contain myself. The limbic system is really essentially the brain's alarm system. It is a really important mechanism shared with all mammals. In fact, it's sort of considered part of that reptilian brain. It's very old part of the brain and it's that part of the brain whose sole purpose really is survival of the species. And so it is designed with this intricate um, evolutionary alarm system to sense a threat, to signal ourselves that there is an imminent threat within our environment and then to compel us into action that is designed to secure our safety and sort of keep us alive. And so that's really the main sort of neurological or, or part of our brain that's in continual activation right now, I would say. Um, and I love this picture because this to me sort of is the image that keeps coming back when I think about the mental health impact of COVID-19. This is a great example sort of of that limbic system in high activation. We in this scenario are unfortunately the zebra and COVID-19 is that, um, you know, sneaky sort of like coming closer tiger that is approaching us. And what you'll notice I think is that the zebras are very clearly sensing some danger in their environment. You notice that they are very still their sensory system seems to be on high alert. 
their ears are very upright, they're taking in all of the information that they need to take in in order to be able to act in the next couple of seconds and ensure survival of themselves and their herd. And so this is kind of what's happening to us right now. We are hyper alert. We are very keenly aware of a threat in our environment. We're paying very close attention to it and we're taking action um, or we're feeling the need to act. And so I think we'll come back to this slide again just as a reference point. But for me, this really signals exactly what's happening um, in our brains and why we sort of feel the way that we're feeling. So what is happening inside our bodies? We know that this limbic system is activated. It's sensing this danger in our environment that is this pandemic. And a couple of things happen in our body automatically. This is our autonomic nervous system. So these are not things that happen because we think about them happening, because we intentionally do these things. These are things that happen automatically when our brain senses danger. Um, and so we see our little brain up at the top there looking very, very stressed out and um, his hypothalamus is activated and a couple of things are automatically happening. And we've probably all experienced this if we've almost been in a car accident or have been in a car accident, if we've gotten really bad news, um, if we've had some kind of shock to our system, the earthquake is a great example of this. We can probably all relate back to it. And so what we know when our, our brain senses an, a threat and this system is activated is that our heart rate can increase, our blood pressure can drop. Um, digestion is not that important for survival. And so our digestive system might kind of slow down or go to sleep. Our liver starts immediately converting glycogen to glucose because like those zebras who are about to either run off or attack that lion, we need to have an exorbitant amount of energy to be able to sort of carry us through the action part of that alarm system. We know that our bronchial tubes are dilated. We get this sort of short, shallow, rapid breathing. And our little adrenal gland, glands, who are the little dancing um, kidney bean looking guys in the middle, they live for this, right? This is their moment to shine. This is kind of what their purpose in life is, which is to excrete um, to release all of these stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol, oxytocin, that kind of gets the body revved up and ready for action. And if we were to go back to that zebra photo, and that was a, a National Geographic video, we would see the herd running off, fighting back. Um, we would see some sort of significant action taking place. And this system is gearing up for that action. And so this system then kicks into sort of our stress responses. But before we kind of talk about that, I just want to talk about the different types of stress, because I know there's a lot of talk about, oh, this, this is so stressful, and it is very stressful. And stress is something as psychologists, especially as it relates to um, companies and businesses, we're often asked to talk about stress management, stress in the workplace. And so just taking a minute, I think, to differentiate between the different types of stress is really important so that we understand what's happening right now. Stress in itself is not a bad thing. We have positive sources of stress in our life. This kind of might be brief and mild activations of that stress system we've just talked about. So that might be me doing this presentation today, a little bit of a rapid heart rate, you know, woke up early, kind of a little bit keyed up and ready. Um, but at the end, this sort of sense of competence, um, a sense of having accomplished something, this is the kind of stress we experience, maybe starting a new job or headed into a competition, taking on a task that we're, we're really excited to do. And at the end of it, we feel really good about something that we've accomplished. Um, it's that stress that pushes us to, um, to achieve and to excel. Tolerable stress, the yellow zone there is kind of Serious stress, um, it's usually a temporary activation of that stress system, and it's often buffered or mitigated by the supportive relationships. This might be things like death, um, the loss of a job, a major illness, the earthquake that we went through a couple of months ago would be that kind of serious but temporary activation of our stress system. And then we move into toxic stress, and this is the stuff that when we, we listen to our medical professionals that talk about being really, really dangerous to our health systems. Toxic stress is that prolonged activation of that stress system. So that 
alarm system, that limbic system is designed really to trigger, to initiate action, to secure safety, and then to deactivate. Um, and toxic stress kind of keeps that alarm system going and firing. Um, we often think of toxic stress related to things like war, um, living in severe, profound poverty, living in violent families or violent situations. So a lot of childhood trauma we think about as toxic stress. So that constant activation of that system, that constant sensing for some danger in our environment. And where COVID-19 is going to fit for us is going to depend a lot on how we manage the stress as we go through the next couple of months. And for some of us, it may turn out to have a toxic effect, but we're hoping through webinars like this and making resources available that this becomes something that was tolerable. It was very serious. It was this sort of prolonged activation, but we mitigated it with support. We mitigated it with um, taking good care of ourselves. So what are some typical responses to stress? And we kind of look at these four quadrants of of our, our existence, I guess, physical, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral. And as psychologists, we often spend most of our life um, digging around in the emotional, behavioral, or cognitive, and then the physical obviously pay, plays a role. And so um, we can probably relate to a lot of these ourselves over the last couple of months, but physical signs, racing heart, sleep interruption, headaches, stomach aches, um, those tend to be, you know, general aches and pains, um, just a general fatigue sometimes people are expressing. The emotional responses where there might be a lot of fear or a lot of anxiety, this overwhelming sense of dread, I think a lot of people are reporting, and certainly increases in irritability and aggression. aggression. From a cognitive perspective, this is the way that we think and, and store and process information. Um, I can attest to sort of poor concentration, things that would typically take me an hour, maybe taking me four hours now. That's an important one for employers to keep in mind. Racing thoughts, thoughts that just kind of interrupt into our brain. They might burst in and we're not really able to get them out. We might be more forgetful than usual and we might have some, make a bit more mistakes than typical. So some poor mental acuity or just being able to, you know, not as sharp as we typically are. And behavior we see maybe avoidance. We typically avoid things that are really stressful. People might be a bit withdrawn or changes in routine. Um, we could add a bunch on here. We see you know, increase in substance use. Um, we can get into that in the question part if people have specific questions about certain things that they're maybe experiencing or seeing in their families or workplaces. So that just kind of shows you that stress affects our whole being, really. Um, we're talking a lot about our physical health right now as it relates to the pandemic. And I guess for us today, just wanting to also help us to recognize that there are these other quadrants or these other components of our human experience that really need to be paid attention to as well. Um, when we're in an acute stress state, which I would say that we all are now, we kind of are aiming to be in that yellow zone in the middle, which is that kind of like calm and present, rational, thoughtful, intentional. But for many of us, it's hard to maintain our status there. When we're under a great deal of stress, we often have sort of default stress responses. And we've probably all heard of the fight flight response. Um, a couple of years ago, through a lot of trauma research, they added the freeze response. And so we know that in, in response to a stressor or a threat, we often engage in either this fight, flight, or freeze response. And what we know is that where you go in response to acute stress often depends on your past, um, your histories, your current, like what was going on right at the time this was starting. Um, and so I put this on there just so that we can kind of be aware, we can start to think about what might be my response, what am I seeing in myself or the people around me. And so the fight flight response is typically that, um, you know, anxious, overwhelmed, um, maybe emotional outbursts, aggression. It's interesting, the obsessive compulsive behavior, we certainly saw a lot of that in the very beginning of this with that kind of obsessive shopping or needing to kind of have as much um, stuff available as possible. Overeating, we're hearing a lot about that, and also impulsivity. So just being a bit more um, quick to act, a little bit more difficult to kind of engage that thinking before doing process right now. 
And then there are others who will kind of maybe more gravitate to that freeze response, which tends to be more of a numbing or a disconnection as opposed to the fight flight where there's this high alert and real intense emotional experience. The freeze response might be kind of more of a, of a shutting down, of a, of a not feeling things, of a disconnection. And I think what's important and why this slide is important is that so we can have a bit of compassion. I know in the beginning, particularly, there was a lot of criticism and judgment of how one another was acting. There was a lot of opinions, I guess, flying around in terms of what people were or were not doing. And so I guess to recognize that we're all going to respond slightly different and where we hit on this um, graph um, depends on a lot of complicated things. And so if we can kind of just pour a little bit of compassion, I guess, to those who might go in opposite direction to ourselves, I think that's gonna help um, over the next couple of weeks and months. So compassion to ourselves, but also to our neighbors, if we see them acting in a way that doesn't make sense to us or doesn't align with the way that we're responding, doesn't make it wrong. So what is unique to COVID-19? And I think this is the key piece here is that we have a lot of research around what happens when we are in acute threat activation. Um, but there's less so. I know Pauline was talking about some research that has come out of some um, countries where they've had um, epidemics before. But what we're seeing that's so unique right now is that we have this threat, which is the coronavirus. It's present. It's out there. We're hearing about it all the time. Our alarm system is activated because that's a neurological thing. We don't really have any choice over that. And we don't want to stop it anyways because it's really adaptive. We're paying attention just like those zebras, right? We're really paying attention to what information we need. We're taking action. And then ideally we should be able to kind of return to that state of calm. And what makes this current pandemic so concerning from a mental health perspective is that unlike a typical threat, those zebras are gonna run away, fight off, um, and then they're gonna kind of like collapse and sleep for the rest of the day and then wake up and regroup and carry on and then maybe they'll be threat again in a couple of weeks. But we're waking up every day to this constant threat. This threat is not going away. We've been living with it for about the past eight weeks now and it continues on. And so we're seeing this cycle activate constantly, our attention focus, there's news every day, our actions changing and our efforts to regulate um, are really key. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a couple of slides. And I think just so people are aware, that's what makes this so unique. And that I think is what makes uh, the mental health professional community so concerned and wanting to make sure we get this message out and wanting to make sure people understand what they can be doing in small doses because that threat keeps that alarm system activated, which is pushing us towards that toxic stress experience. And that's really what we wanna buffer with all of our attention and action and efforts to regulate. And so we're really sort of stuck in this loop right now and it doesn't look like it's going to be um, ending in the near future, although I certainly feel good about where we are as a community, but we're still needing to be vigilant. Um, I want to just talk a little bit, we, we hear the words fear and anxiety intermixed quite a bit, right? I'm afraid of that, I'm anxious about that, and I just wanted to just, I guess, tease them apart a bit so people understand um, the difference between the two. Fear really is that emotional response to an immediate threat, and it's associated with our neurological fight-flight-freeze response, so it's related directly to that limbic system. And it's an emotional response to something that is immediate. If somebody was to bust in my door, I would feel fear. Um, anxiety, on the other hand, is an emotional response, but to the anticipation or the future events, right? And so we often have a lot of physiological responses, tummy aches, um, a little bit of restlessness, headaches, and behavioral symptoms, maybe avoiding those things that we're feeling worried about or fearful, um, anticipating. And so if, you know, the fear might be of somebody busted in my office, but if I thought somebody might bust in my office any time now, then I'm kind of in this state of anxiety, waiting or anticipating this fearful event to happen. And I think what's interesting is in cognitive behavioral therapy, the stuff that uh, Pauline specializes in, you tease out sort of what is imminent, what is real, what is um, possible. And what we're seeing now is that we're sort of sitting in the middle of all of it, right? So we have fear, present, real, imminent threat. 
And we also have anxiety, anticipatory, future, what ifs, tons of uncertainty. And so I think that also is what increases the load that our brain is currently experiencing, right? So if we think of all those stress things that happen, we've kind of got ourselves, we've got ourselves in this COVID-19 threat loop. And then we've also got this double whammy of both fear, which is present and immediate, and anxiety, which is anticipatory and future orientated. And so we're, we're sort of in this, I guess, a matrix of both of these happening to us at the exact same time. And one thing we've been talking a lot about, and I know has come up in a lot of the work that we've done, is this there's a concept in psychology called the intolerance of uncertainty. And it's, it's very much linked to our modern world. And it's even more so now that we have, you know, technology that we currently have, we are a society that does not like not knowing. We are accustomed to information available at our fingertips. We are, um, we're calmed and regulated in some regard by having information. So we were talking last night and I used the example of most of us don't take a holiday without knowing exactly what kind of car we're renting, um, exactly what the interior of, of our hotel room is gonna look like, what time the museum opens that we hope to visit when we get there. We live in a world where we have information overload. We have everything that we need to absolutely be certain about almost everything in our life. And so we've become accustomed to it and information has become the way that we kind of calm ourselves down. We regulate that system. And unfortunately, right now, there is so much uncertainty. We don't know who has the virus. We don't know if we have the virus. We don't know when it's going to end. We don't know when things are going to change. We don't know when we can, um, the airport will open. There's so much unknown right now. And as human beings, we've never really enjoyed uncertainty. And in this sort of modern age, more than any other, um, I think period in the history of the human being, um, we don't like uncertainty at all right now. And so just as another piece of information to keep in mind, why is this so unsettling? It's because there's so much uncertainty related to this. And I wanna just kind of hop back a bit if we remember our little adrenal gland glands that we're all excited about this. One of the main hormones that they release is oxytocin. This is released by those pituitary glands when we perceive a threat and it's intended to increase social desire. It pushes us towards our herd because there is survival in numbers, right? Those zebras on that, um, on that, on, on those planes, they were very acutely aware of where their herd was. I bet they could tell you where their babies were and they probably knew where their vulnerable people were. And so there is strength in safety in the number of people, the number of zebra in a herd, which is why we sort of saw them clustered tight. That's this oxytocin, right? We know that oxytocin levels are very high um, when women have first given birth um, or when they're holding their babies. It compels sort of parental protection hormones and it pushes us towards sort of social systems and, and networks of people. And it's that herd kind of desire. And what's, I think, fascinating and also equally stressing about the current pandemic is that while our brain is telling us to go find our people, um, the reality of this public health crisis is telling us to stay away from people. And so we've got our brain pushing us in one direction and the reality of our world stopping us from being able to act in that way. And so if we remember that alert attention action, this kind of natural action that we might want to be doing, which is going to the people who support us and come for us, we're not able to do that right now. And so it's just another piece of information for us to be aware of in terms of why this is so potentially impactful from a mental health perspective. Um, okay, so what's going to help us right now? We have to accept that what we're experiencing is a very normal, adaptive, um, evolutionary experience in a highly abnormal situation. And so what our brains and our bodies are doing is very adaptive, very natural, but the circumstances around it are so abnormal. It's something that we have never, you know, I think a hundred and something years ago was the last pandemic. So it is nothing that we have any point of reference around. 
So what's really important is that we're patient with ourselves and with others. Hopefully this information today gives you cause to be able to kind of just think differently about yourself, your own reaction or the reactions of others. We need to really also be very, very flexible right now and find some predictability in small moments. Um, and we need to be preventative. I think it's amazing. Um, people often sort of seek professional mental health advice expecting this kind of, you know, um, big piece of information or this really complicated answer. But what we know has kept our community safe from COVID-19 thus far are small actions of washing our hands, of standing six feet apart from each other, of wearing a mask. Those are small um, preventative measures. Those aren't major um, medical uh, um, procedures. Those are small, tiny actions that each of us takes on a fairly frequent basis throughout our day. And our mental health prevention is exactly the same. It's just recognizing what things we can do, small little moments, small little actions or activities that we can take on a daily basis. It's really going to help to kind of bring some calm to that very activated part of our brain. And so what do we have control over? If we go back to this cycle, right? We do not have any control over this virus. Um, I'm trusting science. I, I feel like we'll get there with vaccines. I'm following our government's orders. I'm, I, you know, there's not much that the average citizen can do related to this threat, um, except do what we're told by those people who know more than us in terms of the world of epidemiology. There's nothing that we can do about our alarm system and our brain activating. In fact, we wouldn't want to shut it off even if we could because we'd be in really big trouble um, when this all passed. But where we do have some opportunity to help ourselves is in the attention, action, um, and regulation parts of this, of this cycle. And so we're just going to talk a little bit about that. Um, we need to be really careful about what our attention is focused on. We need to manage our information intake. And I know we've heard this a lot. But hopefully hearing it in this context will help us understand that our brains really depend on that. Um, not all news is equal and we need to really be taking some regular information breaks. And we also need to be aware of perspective shifting. So what is it that we are looking at? And I, I didn't pull the most recent dashboard from yesterday's press conference. Um, but you know, the numbers, you know, we heard yesterday 17 more positive and that kind of activates that system. That's a scary number. We don't like to hear that. Um, it can be a bit upsetting for some of us. But also, if we look at the whole truth, there was 1,100 negatives, right? And so it's making sure that while we're looking at information, we're looking at all of the information. And sometimes we hone in on those things which can be fearful or can evoke our anxiety. And that's okay. But we just want to balance it by making sure that we're looking at the whole picture. So if you're checking the dashboard on a daily basis, that's okay. But just make sure you're reading all parts of it. And you're really focusing and letting sort of what it all feels like to sink in, right? We've got, as of yesterday, 55 persons recovered. Um, you know, there's nobody in the hospital. So although the number of positives is alarming, the, the whole truth about our current situation can actually help us to just find some calm in the middle of that day. So paying attention, but also understanding why we need to be paying attention. So people are saying this, not just because it sounds good, but because there's a real neurological reason for doing this. Um, we need to be taking some action. And this is really important. We need to create some routines for work or school. I know it's been really challenging for those people who are working at home who might kind of be working in the same place that they're sleeping or working in the same place that they're eating. So trying to create some routine, differentiate some spaces, even if it's tiny acts like covering up your laptop with a blanket at 5.30 when you're done your work day um, or eating out on the patio if your kitchen table has turned into kind of your office zone. We really need to also be taking care of our sleep hygiene. Um, sleep is probably the one of the fastest ways to really assess how stressed you are um, and it's one of the most important things to keep that brain really regulated and calm. We need to be setting some daily tasks and goals and really just focused on this one day at a time mo um, model. My sister is um, 
many, many years into a life of recovery and um, and active in the AA community and so she'll often send, you know, little one day at a time messages. And I think now more than ever, that's such an important message uh, that we should have. It really is kind of just taking this as a moment in time and what actions can I do today, right? We need to set aside some family time. I know it feels like we're with our families 24 seven and we, and many of us are, right? We're working, living, um, with everybody under the same roof, but that's not necessarily family time. So setting aside some time where we're all going to go for a walk, where we're all going to watch a TV show together, we're going to cook a meal together. I think that's really important. There's a tendency to think we're stuck together all day, um, but to set aside what would be sort of a designated time for the family is important. We need to continue to be socially connected. That oxytocin is pumping through our brains and we need some outlet for it. We need to act on its behalf. Um, and so we need to be connected. And I know um, I had a birthday recently and it's fabulous. We had Zoom meetings and um, there's so many creative ways that we can get together and connect. Um, so we need to really carve that out, put that into action. Eating healthy, that's really important right now. Our brains are under so much stress. So whatever we can do to kind of um, help them out, lots of good healthy nutrition, lots of water, easy on the caffeine and the alcohol, that's gonna go a long way with helping our brain to do its job. It knows how to cope with this, but we can help it along. We need to be continuing to follow those public health advisories. That gives me a great deal of comfort. I feel like I know what I can do because I'm following what's being told to me by people that I trust. Um, some people have talked about keeping a journal or a scrapbook as something that's been really helpful. They're just cutting out clippings from newspapers or maybe they're writing little interesting quotes down that they hear throughout the day. And so be active in your efforts to kind of manage your stress and how you're coping. And perhaps the most important is really how do we regulate or calm this alarm system? Um, knowing that it's going to be re-triggered, the press conference, you're going to turn on the newspaper, you're going to get a WhatsApp from somebody, but it's the little moments throughout the day. I use the example, speaking to somebody recently, of a marathon. Um, if you've ever ran a marathon, you know that you don't sort of stop midway and drink a couple of gallons of water. That would not be helpful at all. But what you do do is you take some small sips every half a mile or every mile, and that is what sustains you throughout the 26 miles. And we're in a marathon here. We're in a neurological brain marathon. And it's not these big um, profound actions that are gonna matter. It's what's gonna matter is what we're doing on small little doses on a regular basis throughout the next couple of weeks and months. And the sensory system is the most natural calming mechanism of the brain. If we think back probably to our most comforting memories, our most relaxing um, experiences, they probably all engage the sensory system. There is a smell that goes with it. There's a sound that goes with it. There's a taste that goes with it. And it's because our sensory system is really wired to be that calming mechanism of that limbic activation system. And so we need to be engaging our sensory system. And my OT friends are, are giving all kinds of advice about how to do that really well. But we know anything that kind of gets us smelling or tasting or seeing or touching or feeling. So baking and cooking. Um, these are just a couple of examples. Pulling weeds or gardening. Obviously, there's the smell. There's the touch of the dirt. There's the visual experience, music and dancing. I know music and dancing is helping a lot of people right now. Um, nature, people are saying, get outside and go for a walk. And it's not because you're bored at home, it's because your brain really needs this sensory experience of being in nature. And again, it's kind of like taking a sip of water on the marathon. It's really what your brain needs. And so it's not something that we're saying because it sounds nice, it's something that we're saying because it's really important as a mental health preventative tool. Mindfulness, we've probably heard a lot about that. Mindfulness is a fancy word for paying attention to ourselves. To be mindful is really to be aware of myself in a moment. What am I thinking? How am I feeling? Um, what's my body telling me? It's being present in our own selves for a moment in time and that action of just kind of stopping for a minute throughout the day and, and paying attention to what's going on, just noticing my heart is racing, noticing I'm kind of irritable, and then maybe doing something to help us go, you know, outside for a walk, make a cup of tea, call up a friend, 
whatever it is that can help in that moment. And then obviously movement, we need to get this, um, when those adrenal glands are releasing things like cortisol and oxytocin, we would typically burn those off. Those zebras are gonna, you know, if we fast forward that video, they are in for a fight. They are fighting back. They are running off high speed miles to get away from this threat. We are not running off. We, on the other hand, have been told to sit inside our houses. So again, it's counterintuitive to what our body wants to do. Our body has all of this stress hormone sort of soaring through it, and we don't have a way to burn it off unless we are moving. And so when they talk about exercise, and, and Dr. Lee talks about exercise, it's really from a medical foundation and understanding what our bodies need right now. So any kind of exercise, walking, yoga, this it's just really about taking care of your brain right now. So thinking of exercise, not necessarily as a weight loss or um, for any other purpose, but to burn off some of those stress hormones that our brain is pumping out in, in its efforts to keep us safe. And so I just wanna give a couple of little quick examples. So mindfulness is a minute by minute thing. And, and I wrote this and posted this on our social media account, but we've been so diligent in hand washing and it really is saving lives, right? When you think about it, it's kind of our number one tool against COVID-19. And, and I thought, what a great way to combine being mindful with this amazingly powerful public health action. And so when you're washing your hands next time, instead of thinking about what's on your to-do list at work, because that's future, or um, thinking about all the things that you didn't do you know, last night, because that's past, just be really moment by just be really present in the moment and pay attention to what the soap smells like and how the water feels on your hands, the sounds that are around you in the bathroom, um, what it feels like to dry your hands off with that cloth. Is it soft? Is it rough? That minute right there as you wash your hands, you're not only doing something extremely important to stop the pandemic, but you're also doing something extremely important that just pops your brain into that green regulated zone for a minute so that you can open that door and go back at it again, right? It's giving ourselves these minutes so that we can continue to carry on. Here's another great one, any kind of breath work, and any of you that might be practice meditation or mindfulness or yoga are gonna be really well equipped for this. Those of us that maybe aren't that into these things before this are certainly benefiting right now. Um, so simple breathing techniques, like holding your breath for a couple of seconds, then breathing out for a couple of seconds, holding again, and then breathing in. So this is a breathing square. There's all kinds of ways that you can do this, but it's, you know, maybe every red light, you're going to stop and you're going to take, you know, five deep breaths. Those are the kind of little sips of water throughout this pandemic that our brain is really relying on us to do. I'm a big fan of affirmations, so I love a little reminder, a little mantra for the day. And there's a lot of great ones going around. Social media is full of so much positivity right now. So, you know, focusing on what's in my control. Um, I am resilient. This is just a moment in time. What can I do for myself right now? Those kinds of affirmations they're not only sort of sound good, feel good, but they really have some neurological basis in terms of regulating that alarm system. And then, you know, we live in this modern day of technology, so let's take advantage of it for ourselves right now. There are some fantastic apps, um, and this is only just a sample. I'm sure there are hundreds of others, so if you know of some, share it. I know for, like, I've got the, I don't know if you can see my Apple Watch, but they, autumn, they have this little breathe thing on it. And I used to have mine set to breathe at about 6 p.m., which was typically when I was in rush hour traffic on my way home. I've got it set now that it goes for a minute on the hour every hour. And so it gives me a little vibrate and it reminds me to breathe for one hour. And I'm doing that and it's really making a difference. And I think it's, again, it's akin to those small sips of water. You know, if we're carrying a big load of bricks up a hill, we're gonna stop every now and then, put the bricks down, give our muscles a bit of a break, pick them back up and carry on. And that from a mental health perspective is really what we're doing right now is we're just, because we're in this state, we're really preventing a long-term mental health problem. So um, I wanna just have a few, uh, I've got a couple of slides about children. So I think what I'll do is I'll go through these and then we'll kind of just, the presentation will be done and then we'll open up to general questions as a whole, if that sounds like a good idea. Felicia and Pauline, yeah? Um, so I love that picture because I don't know that that's, 
if that's what anybody's house actually looks like right now that has little kids at home. Um, so one of the things that I think is really important for us to keep in mind is, again, understanding from a neurological perspective what happens when parents and children are afraid. And what we know is that scared children naturally signal their parents, right? They automatically run towards parents. We've all seen this. Um, a, you know, a dog barks, our little ones kind of come towards us. We're at a playground and there's a something happens and our kids run towards us or we run towards them, right? So we know that scared children will naturally send a signal to their parents and they'll run towards their parents, they'll seek reassurance from their parents. And again, this is very adaptive. It's what keeps baby zebras alive, right? Because they run towards mama when the tiger is coming. And parents of scared children naturally do things, which is they naturally protect. They naturally reassure and provide comfort. And so we see this. I mean, I, I know in the first couple of weeks, there was this great um, panic amongst parents whose children were overseas. There was this almost sort of, um, I can only call it maybe this like innate um, primal need to get our children under our roof. And then once they were under our roof, we could kind of go, oh, okay, we can kind of deal with anything else. But there really was that need for our kids to be safe. And so parental protection is really functional. It's very adaptive and it's part of this same limbic system activation. If you remember oxytocin, it's compelling us to kind of be protective parents. And so um, it's important that we understand that, but it's also important to understand in terms of how this can kind of backfire against us if we're not careful. There is a real clear parent fear response cycle. We know that um, from you know brain imaging studies, they've looked at sort of if, if mama or dad are really worried, kids sense that. They can sense this kind of um, energy in the air. And we know that, that, that worried and scared parents and worried and scared children are intimately connected to one another. And so they get kind of stuck in this cycle of um, pull, you know, being afraid, pulling close, the pulling close kind of signals children that there's something really terrible going on. And that can kind of um, get this cycle of fear going on for our kids. And this is normal, right? I mean, this is normal given what's happening. And so to want your kids close is a really normal thing. To kids wanting to be close is again, very adaptive and important. So what are some parents reporting to us right now? Um, and again, all of these completely normal given what we're going through as a community. So in toddlers, we're seeing a lot of regression. We're seeing maybe, you know, maybe the three-year-old that was potty trained is now wetting the bed or wanting to be in a pull-up. We're seeing a lot of disrupted sleep across all ages of childhood, right into adulthood, actually. So sleep is probably the most dysregulated thing that happens when we're in that active system. We see a lot of toddlers being a bit more whiny and clingy and they're having maybe more tantrums, maybe our really calm, chill three-year-old has just become very, very challenging in the last couple of weeks. And again, all of it's really normal, and we want to make sure that we're being really patient and understanding in our response. Childhood, middle childhood, maybe, you know, our sort of five to 12-year-olds, these guys are worrying a lot. They are old enough to kind of know what's going on, um, but they're still very dependent on parents, they don't have the autonomy of adolescence yet to form their own opinions. So they're very connected and very aware of what mom and dad are doing. So there might be a lot of questions. There's a lot of watching what parents are doing. They're having difficulty sleeping as well, or they're staying up late, they're sleeping longer into the day. There's some complaining that they're bored. Um, you know, these are, they, they're not maybe as connected online social media as the teens are, but they're missing their friends at school, they're missing their after school activities. There's a lot of reassurance seeking with parents, a lot of checking, where are you going? How long are you going? When are you coming back? What's happening? There's a lot of controlling behavior that I'm hearing about. So being quite demanding, um, that's again, very normal. When we're kind of out of control, what do we do? We up our efforts to control because that helps to regulate us. And there's a lot of emotional outbursts. Again, we're all kind of, um, a little bit overreactionary when it comes to how we're managing our emotions. And our teens, we're seeing them a bit maybe more withdrawn from the family and, and very socially connected to their own peers. Um, again, 
teenagers don't sleep well at the best of times, but even more so, especially if they're sort of gaming late into the night and school isn't really ramping up till nine or 10. We see a lot of overeating in our adolescents, um, irritability, expressions of frustration. They are invincible, right? I mean, adolescents developmentally are invincible. And so they don't understand why they can't go to their friends. We're getting a lot of complaining, challenging the rules. This lockdown is dumb. I'm not going to get it. Again, that's very developmentally appropriate, right? It makes life challenging if you've got a teenager at home, but it's to understand that what's going on again, very normal. So how can we support children? I think the most important thing we can do is keep that parent-child um, cycle in mind and take care of ourselves first, right? If we are managing our own worry, if we're managing our own mental health, then our children are going to have less of an activated energy in the house on which can activate their systems. And so if we're maintaining calm and regulation and routines and consistency at home, it's going to have a positive impact on our children. And so I think as a parent, I like knowing that there's something that I can do to help my kids. And so the onus really is on us to be really, really diligent in how we're managing our own mental health. This doesn't mean that we can't have kids with mental health problems. Um, it just means that right now in the midst of this, the more we can do to take care of ourselves, the better for everybody. We need to be patient with ourselves and our partners and our children. I know there's a lot of energy in families right now, particularly families where parents are working from home, where kids are homeschooled, you know, maybe we're, you know, we've got different ways of feeding lunch, or we've got different ways of helping with homework. We've got to pick our battles right now. That's really important. We've got to let go of some things and decide what's really important. Um, everybody's coping, I guess, in the best way that they can. We need to talk about this virus with kids in a developmentally appropriate way. Um, Adult TV is for adults. And so as much as possible to limit the background TV stations or the constant playing of things in the background, kids are really attuned to that. And they might not be paying attention, but they can report back later things that they heard. We need to limit their access to information that will increase that fear. So those shock statements, right? I mean, I think I encountered about 10 people yesterday that were the first thing they greeted me with was 17 more positives. That's a shock statement. We can say it to another adult, but we want to kind of keep that away from kids, right? If they have questions about what's going on, we can give them, this is what's happening. These are how many people were tested. These are how many people were negative. These are how many people were in the hospital. And there are some people that tested positive and this is what we're doing to take care of them. So giving the exact same information to them, but avoiding those kind of shock statements and maintaining routines, but being reasonably flexible. And I know that, that, that parents are like, what does that mean? It means that things like bedtime and meals and schoolwork and play, routines that you would have had before, it's really important that you're trying as much as you can to maintain those because that gives kids a sense of safety. Um, behavioral expectations as well. Consistent rules help children to feel safe. Chores bring a sense of routine. So if it was always their job to feed the dog, they, they should still be feeding the dog. If it was their job to take the trash out or rake the yard, they should still be doing those things. It's giving them a sense of consistency and safety that actually is very calming for them. It tells them, okay, this is normal. I'm used to this. This makes sense to me. And it can actually help them with their concentration at school, their emotional management, if their structure around them is consistent. And so I know that there is sort of um, this tendency like, oh, they're, they're going through so much. We're going to not let them do any, you know, we're not going to, they can eat on the couch. Well, if you could never eat on the couch before COVID-19, I'd encourage that you don't eat on the couch now um, because it's that if everything becomes inconsistent for kids, it leaves them with no stable footing and they really need some stable footing right now. They need to be able to anchor into things that are predictable and consistent and rules and behavioral expectations and routines at home are really important for kids to feel a sense of safety and calm. Um, focusing on sleep and nutrition and movement, encourage free play, art, sensory play, and play present with them. So I know right now there's this tendency, like I said, to think that we're always together, but sometimes it means putting things down and just going in the backyard and digging with them or driving trucks with them or making a puzzle with them. Offer reassurance and support, but um, 
I work with a lot of kids that have anxiety disorders and my approach is to not work with the kids directly, but I work with parents in terms of their own behaviors and the ways in which they accommodate that child's worry and fear. And so if you've got a really um, profound worrier, you want to be careful in terms of not getting stuck in this loop of constantly reassuring. Reassurance should make a child feel better and calmer. And if you give them reassurance and then they kind of go, oh, and they settle into sort of some comfort and they can go off and play and do their homework, then that reassurance is helpful. But if they're back for reassurance five minutes later or five minutes after that or 10 minutes after that, then that reassurance is not helping them. So we need to be thinking of other ways to give them some safety. So that's something I would be watching for. And we need to be connecting with our teens. So letting them pick, you know, watch whatever Netflix series they want, even if it doesn't make any sense to you. These are the kind of things that help you to be present with them. Um, watch them game. I know some parents have said, you know, I never really did know what gaming they were doing, but now I've actually sat with them and I've let them spend an hour telling me about it. And gosh, they get so excited and we talk about so many things. And so I think those are some important things that we can be doing. And then I guess when to seek professional help, we know that there's certain risk factors. So anyone in your household with a history of a mental health problem obviously needs to be taking increased preventative measures, just like our vulnerable health population, those with compromised immune systems or asthma or diabetes, we're doubling up on the preventative measures for them. The same is true with mental health. So if you have a history of mental health issues or anybody in your family, you wanna double up on your awareness um, and your prevention. And if you're concerned about yourself, if you sort of any of the things that we talked about today are happening, but yet you don't really feel like you have a good plan for how you can mitigate or how you can manage it, then reach out. All of the mental health providers on island are offering telehealth. They're all available. So I think it's, it's better to sort of ask for help, be reassured yourself, and then carry on as opposed to kind of worrying and wondering on your own. And that's the end of our presentation. And so if anybody has any questions, um, we can open that up. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Will, should I stop sharing the slide? I, I think you probably should for now. I mean, and then we can see if there's anybody who has, okay. has any questions out there. Um, again, you can use the chat feature. Um, don't be shy. There's, um, we, we won't, uh, no question is silly. <laughs> so um, this is an open discussion. So if you wanna raise your hand or if you want to put something in the chat, that'd be great. Well, I, I think maybe I'll start Shannon because obviously um, the Chamber of Commerce is a business organization. Um, we, we tend to, to be results oriented um, you know, businesses tends to be that way and all of us are put pressure. Can you give like the managers who are in the call some advice as to how they should be treating their employees during this time? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's really important that managers or business owners recognize their own stress and manage that as well as they can. Um, recognizing that that what staff are going through, I think, is an, a really important thing. Um, I'm not a, a business management expert, but I'll, what I've tried to do in my own business is be really transparent, be very open with sort of where we're at as a business. Um, you know, kind of as things progress in the business, being very honest with, with the staff in terms of what's happening making, you know, commitments, short-term commitments so that I can be sure to um, follow through with those and then sort of be open to any feedback. We've tried to do um, lots of check-ins and prioritize their safety, give them time and space to kind of come with their own needs. So I hope Felicia is shaking her head that, yeah, that's what I did. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that for, as a small business, I mean, I've got a staff of 26. I don't know if that's what, how that chamber sees that, but I think You're for- a medium -sized business. <laughs> pardon? You're a medium-sized business. I'm a medium-sized business. So <laughs> as a medium, I mean, that's certainly the approach I've taken, which was to just be really transparent and also to trust people. I think what I've, you know, is I've realized how amazing we can actually do working from home, right? And I've talked to a lot of business owners 
that have been sort of pleasantly surprised at how efficient things can be from home. I've got some staff who are parents, so making sure that there's lots of flexibility. If they need to um, have their days free and they want to do their, their work in the evening or on the weekend, or they need to tag team it with their partner, then all, you know, just being really flexible and very grateful. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of eternally grateful for how hard I've seen everybody working. People have been really creative. So I guess that would be my advice is to just keep the lines of communication really open um, and be really forthcoming with information. I think, you know, when, when, as a business owner, when you're uncertain and I, there's been days in this whole process when I was really uncertain, right? To be, to just share that as, as, as clearly and as concisely and without a lot of, you know, um, drama or um, feel sorry for me, but really like, this is where we're at. This is my plan. And this is my promise. And this is what I need. Be clear in what you need from your employees. Um, and I think that's my only advice is what I've tried to do in my own business right well, now. Thank you. And I think, I think, I think validating the employee. Yeah. You know, validating how they're feeling, you know, how are you doing? And just kind of giving some positives. I heard from quite a few adult clients worrying about losing their job because they're trying to teach their homeschool children and they're trying to do these, these, and these, worrying that they're actually going to lose their job because they're not doing a good enough job. So giving positive phrase, praise and validating is so important right now. Giving them reassurance. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. I see Anson has a question, so I'm going to unmute your mic. Anson? Hello, hi, good morning, good morning. To everyone, and thanks so very much. Uh, very useful uh, presentation, Shannon. Um, you touched on a point which I wanted to follow up on, which was uh, kids and sleep and regulating their their patterns. It's it's a struggle. It's and I'm sure everyone on this line, whoever has kids, have that issue. Um, it's just a struggle to get them to to try to adhere to the you know the 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 sleep patterns with going to sleep at going to, going to bed at the regular time uh, in in some cases i find my kids are just they can't get to bed until 1 p.m 1 a.m and then they're, they're you know they're dragging out of bed in the morning and once that happens to them then of course it impacts us so we've tried so many things between my wife and myself in terms of trying to get them regulated what additional um pointers can you give us to 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 help us to try to put some normalcy and, and regulate their lives a bit better so that it, you know, so that it, it reflects better on us. Yeah. Pauline, do you want to take that one? Yeah, that's very difficult. If, and if you're having problems with it before the pandemic, it's probably gotten even worse. I mean, giving a child to, to let, letting them have a false sense of control. Do you want to go to bed at nine or nine 30? And you don't really care what the two options are but giving them that sense of control will be easier to get them to say, okay, 9.30, time to go. I don't know how old your children are, but setting a timer, okay, go set the timer for a half an hour. We have a half hour more. And then when it goes off, kids are more apt if they have that, that full sense of control. You're still controlling it. And yeah. setting out the guidelines and what can be the positive rewards for following some type of structure right now, because it's really hard. Anton, how old are your children? My kids are, are 11 and 17, respectively. Yeah. And is it both you're having oh. difficulties with? And it's both I'm having difficulties with. And it wasn't so bad before. Um, you know, it, just like any kid, you always have your challenges and you always have to manage, you know, mm -hmm. the bedtimes, et cetera. But it's just gotten incredibly difficult during this period and you know, one of the things that I've tried to start doing is us getting up at 6 a.m., 6.30, you know, and going for a run, making sure that everyone in the house, we go for a jog together as a family. And, mm -hmm. you know, but then what happens is is that's come back to, to kind of bite me because then they come home and they take a shower and then they are up and then they they, they do the schoolwork and then they they go to sleep. Yeah. And yeah. Then they, You're in a, it's a bad pattern. They crash and they sleep mm -hmm. for two days, two, for two hours then it means that at night it throws the entire yeah. sleep cycle off again. So, you know, yeah. so I just wanted to raise that because, you know, just to hear if you're, you know, you know, if there are any suggestions, because it, it definitely is a, is a significant challenge. And Anson, you're not alone. This is a lot happening in a lot of families. I mean, maybe I, I could offer a quick suggestion, sit down as a family and write some house rules. 
and then maybe okay. positive towards add them up. I don't know what it is. You can put stars in a chart. You can put quarters in a jar for everyone that follows the rules. And then when we're out of quarantine, do something after or somehow we buy ice cream. I don't normally recommend food, but something like that where everybody <laughs> has to say what the house rules are. And of course, you're going to guide them in the right direction. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. It does. Yeah. Thank, thanks for that input, guys. Um, and answer it. If you, if you want to email me and have a quick chat, please feel free. For sure. Think, Thank you. Okay. I'll thing. put my email up here for you. Sure. I think another thing to keep in mind is to kind of like slow the whole household down at night, right? Like Absolutely. Um, if, if, you know, sort of dim the lights and start talking about bedtime coming up. Adolescents are hard, right? Yep. Um, you know, can you control the Wi-Fi? Can you say, okay, everybody, you know what? We all need to be getting a bit more sleep. It's so easy to stay up all night because your friends are all online or you can game online or I can spend all night online, right? Doing things and looking things up. So we're going to just collectively turn the Wi-Fi off, even if parents continue to have a password that gives them access. But sometimes it's, you know, we're asking kids to log off. That's really hard for most of us as adults to do. And if they've got free, you know, unmanaged Wi-Fi in their bedroom and multiple devices, then we're asking them to do the impossible. So helping them a little bit by saying, you know, let's put all the devices in a basket at 10 o'clock or 9.30, and then we're gonna have a bit of wind down time and then the Wi-Fi goes off or whatever. Like, I think there's those kinds of ways that as parents, we can introduce a little bit more control because kids right now are finding it very hard to control that themselves as, as our adults, right? Absolutely, Shannon. And, and we should talk about media a little bit, how yeah. much kids are on their devices right now. It's going to be more than in a normal school day. But right now there is more time, but there should still be some rules and structure regarding it. Yeah. Ladies, can you kind of address the issue of <clears throat> men's mental health? And, and I ask that because um, men, including myself sometimes, believe that, um, you know, Mental health isn't something that affects us very much. We just have to live through it and get through it. And, and if you don't really um, ask for help, you know, men, men are strong and they, they shouldn't be, you know, they should be, you know, they don't need, need help. I mean, what, what's your view on, on that whole question about mental health for men? I think, I mean, I think mental health for all people, right? But I do definitely think that talking about how we feel is sometimes, um, particularly in our culture, more of a female thing. And so the men sometimes won't maybe want to talk about how hard they're finding something or also their mechanisms for support have been um, interrupted. So I know a lot of men will get together around sport or an activity or at the gym or in the workplace and support each other that way. And those are the things that are stopped right now. And so there, I can only, my husband, for example, you know, has his support system at the gym and his football community. And, and he can attest to like, not having that, it, it's been challenging, right? What do you do with all of that energy, all of that need to kind of talk and, and sort stuff out? Um, so I think, again, it's awareness. If, if It's awareness and patience. So patience, if we see the men in our life having a hard time, but also maybe reminding them that it's okay that they can ask for help. And men challenging one another, like being there for each other, checking in with one another, right? So if you know as a man, that this is going on and you've got male employees, maybe just making sure that you're checking in and saying, hey, let's have a meeting. How are you doing? How's your family doing? Um, what's been the challenge, most challenging piece of this for you? How are you coping? What are some strategies that you're using? And so taking care of one another, I think, uh, is an important way to approach it. And probably if, if men can find that social outlet via the internet, you know, even, I don't know, sitting on video and watching, us. I know, I guess NASCAR started last week, whatever they're into, even if it's an old football game or Matt, somehow getting that connection. And you're right, it's hard for men. Yeah. And a couple of clients I've had have a hard time because they're the main breadwinner. Am I going to lose my job? There's all these things and the wife's stressed out and they don't want to talk to the wife about it. So trying to support them somehow that they find some outlet to talk to somebody 
reaching out to friends. I know men are at, sometimes at a different level than us females who will talk about everything. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the wives watching for warning signs in your husband. You know, if there's things that are happening that don't appear kind of quote unquote normal for our new surreal, unnormal time, that maybe she even reaches out to somebody to say, hey, I'm having this trouble, not quite sure what to do. I can't get him to talk to anybody. And, and making sure that that person is safe. Yeah. Because self-isolation probably has brought upon, you know, challenges for a lot of people who are not used to being in such confined spaces for so long. <laughs> Absolutely. Hopefully, hopefully with people they love, but it, it raises a whole bunch of questions about, you know, you know how, how we communicate. And the, the other thing is, you know, how also we exhibit our frustrations. Um, and that's my other question for all of you is, you know, I know there are a lot of people on this call and many people may not want to admit it, but if there is situations where you feel threatened in self-isolation, you know, what would you recommend on this call to the people listening and maybe when they listen to this recording afterward, what do you recommend to those people who feel threatened in their own home, home, home self-isolation? I think that's a great question, Will. Mm-hmm. We know that um, things like domestic violence, we know substance abuse all escalate during times of high stress. It doesn't mean that those things are to blame, but it means that that's the pattern that we typically see around the world, right? And we there's a lot of stress right now, and so we're seeing an increase in that. So making sure that you have the mental health helpline number available, making sure that you know the number to the crisis center, Um, There's a lot of resources that you can reach out to via the telephone. The crisis center continues to accept um, women and children under the age, I think, of 12 into the shelter. So there there is a place of safety in our community that remains an option if you're feeling like you're in danger in your own home. And also just making sure that you're telling somebody how you're feeling, that you're not keeping that to yourself. So think of one person that you trust that you can share what's going on. And, and maybe it's that there has been a history of abuse before, but maybe it's just that all of this stress has triggered something. And so you've never seen this behavior before, or you've never experienced this before. We don't want people necessarily saying, oh, it's because of this pandemic. We want people still acknowledging that no, I mean, abuse is not appropriate, it's not safe, and, and people's lives matter. And so we want people to continue to reach out for help. We can share, um, the mental health helpline number in the chat and also the um the crisis center hotline as well i can just look that up really quick and save it in the that'd chat. be great i think yeah. that that'll be helpful to a lot of people because again mental health is 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 becoming i think a little bit more mainstream in cayman's context because the alex panton foundation and, and other things the crisis center seems to have a lot more attention but, but again, it's a very personal, mental health is a very personal struggle. And, and I just think it's important that, um, you know, we, we have, have the ability to share in some of, these, um, some of these questions with everybody and get people to understand. So we got another question. Uh, kids can't sleep on time because they want to be online playing games with their friends. <laughs> the generation these days is so in tune with YouTube. TikTok and other social media. So Wi-Fi control is important so their brain can start winding down. So hard times sometimes, it's a big challenge. I can only imagine, I, I'm, my son is fully grown now, but even back in the late 90s, uh, you know, uh, he, it was a struggle even back then. And all of the things that we have now, it's incredible how parents have to struggle with that uh, controlling social media. <clears throat> I think and that's why it's so yeah. important to have all that structure in place because if that structure is gone and the balance is gone because of the pandemic where before we had that that's exactly what kids are going to do it's addictive I could sit online all night if I wanted to so imagine how hard it is for kids to shut it off if we're not giving them what's expected of them daily expectations during the quarantine what are we expecting well we expect you out of bed this time and you know choose your battles you're not going to be as strict as you would be in, without being in this pandemic. And just another sure uncomfortable yourself. question as well. Just, just you know, in, in the idea of, 
these extraordinary times and, and self-isolation has raised a whole bunch of you know, emotional questions in the home and, and tempers flare. And what's your recommendation if somebody in fact feels threatened in the home and there has been physical violence, when do you feel as though the police should become involved? Um, that's a hard question. It I is. Mean, I think we know that if we look at statistics, um, and I'm not professing that these are maybe that current, but I know back in my day when I was heavily involved in the crisis center, we knew that women on average had called the police 10 times before they made the decision to leave a relationship and enter the shelter. We also knew that women often entered the shelter a dozen times before they left that relationship for good. And so leaving and acknowledging violence in a relationship is a process. And it is very unlikely that that process is gonna initiate in the middle of this global pandemic because a lot of times people will feel this sense of safety in their home and we're dealing with two types of safety. One, safety in terms of your physical safety if you're living with um, an abusive partner, but two, the safety related to going outside of your home and being exposed to the pandemic. And so I think that anytime somebody feels threatened in their home, they have the right to call the police. The, in a civil society, our physical safety is protected under the law and the police are there to do that. Um, I think it's recognizing that the options right now in terms of like leaving and going to stay at a friend's house for a couple of my, nights might not be there. Um, checking yourself into a hotel room, which is what a lot of um, victims of domestic violence do in this community, right? They don't wanna go to the crisis center, but they just want a bit of a break. That's not an option right now. And so a lot of what would be typically used as ways to get yourself safe are gone. And so I do think people need to recognize that um, calling the police is an option. If, if you felt threatened by an intruder in your home, you would have no hesitation calling the police. And um, it's really important that we recognize that there are laws in our community. We used to have sort of, you know, the old English rule of thumb that you could beat your wife with a stick as long as it was no bigger than the, the width of your thumb. Those were some of the anchoring cultural and social and religious beliefs of our community. But we know that we have made so much progress away from that. We have the domestic violence intervention legislation. We have um, the crisis center. We have police well-trained to be able to respond to these things. So I think that if you feel unsafe in your home, you have the right and you should be calling because your protection and your safety and the safety of your children matter. Yeah, and either calling the hotline or reaching out to someone in mental health just for a quick chat to say, I need some guidance because every situation is a little different. If there's children involved and the children are getting hurt, absolutely please need to be called mm -hmm. or an elderly person. I Is just gave true? the wrong yes. line for the mental health helpline. Whoops. <laughs> I gave the flu line. <laughs> I make, I'm make. i fixing that. See, there we go. No like mental acuity. No. <laughs> so Pauline, you know, again, whenever you involve police, you go down a road that sometimes leads to unfortunate circumstances for the family, Agreed. right? Mm -hmm. Because it becomes a criminal a criminal activity and, and there'll be an investigation and it opens up a lot of things. So that's the only reason why I asked the question. Obviously, if there's physical harm to any human being in the family, definitely they need to be involved. But I know circumstances where tempers flared, you know, some unfortunate yeah. things happened, you know, they, they, uh, they, they basically, you know, made up after, but unfortunately they had to ask the police to come in. A report was filed and, and unfortunately, you know, from a financial standpoint, it impacted the family from there on in. So I guess I'm not suggesting not to do it, but. No, you know, and that's what every, every case is different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's where I would reach out to a mental health professional to get some guidance. Felicia, you know, what do you think? If it was a temper flaring and it was one off, then, okay, how do we make sure that doesn't happen again? Mm -hmm. Getting Felicia. some extra mental health support will always be necessary to kind of mitigate the negative effects because they may have some negative effects and emotions making that report because it's not easy to do that because you're no. aware of possible um, legal matters that may follow from that. So be able to get additional um, mental health support to work through that 
um, is very important and that's for the perpetrator and for the victim. Um, and even more so if there's children involved and they've been exposed to any kind of violence or any kind of abuse that they get help to support them um, in ways to understand it and not um, take it on. Mm -hmm. Because those negative effects can show up in their behavior um, and can be very overwhelming. It's overwhelming for adults to go through it. So it's even more um, disheartening for children to have to go through it. So to make sure that no matter what, they have support um, that is necessary to be able to get through it. I also think, I think that's a really important point too, Will, that if you are somebody that is, that is having a difficult time right now managing their anger, um, and maybe your outlet for managing your anger are gone. Maybe you used to like to play sport. Maybe you used to talk to your buddies. Maybe you used to be involved in your church. And that, and that sort of was a really important part of your week that kind of reset you. If you feel within yourself that you are losing your temper more often, you're more irritable or angry than is typical, you're starting to see some early warning signs, slamming doors, that, then the onus is really is on you as an individual to reach out for help, right? Because if ultimately the line is crossed and the law is broken, um, there's, there's going to be consequences for that. And so, you know, if you, and that's why I think it's really important that men are checking in with men, that as men in the community worried about other men, be checking in with your neighbor, your brother, your cousin, your uncle. Um, if you see their use of alcohol increasing, we know that that adds to incidents of violence. And so we don't want the message to be, uh, we're all in a pandemic, so violence is okay. The message is violence is never okay which is why we have to take extra preventative measures to check in on one another and to be really honest with ourselves if we feel like that's and it's no different than child abuse i mean from the minute this whole thing happened my concern was child welfare right we've got children at home with really stressed out parents um and we know that that increases the likelihood of child abuse um because you don't get a break you don't get to you know send them to school for eight hours go to work where you get you know like nurtured and supported. And so we know that there's a lot of emotions in all of our homes right now, and especially our homes where there's added stress of, of unemployment, um, added stress where people are living without air conditioning, without adequate food, without immigration security. There's so much stress. The pandemic is one thing, but the socio sort of social consequences of this current situation are the long-term that's that's the path ahead of us and we need to be really diligent in becoming our neighbor's keeper right checking in on the people around and checking in on ourselves being really honest if i feel like i'm screaming way more than i used to and way more than i want to then i need to ask for some help i need to you know the family resource center has done a phenomenal job their social media campaign is brilliant on how can families reduce stress how can families be safe I'd advise anybody to visit their Facebook page, their Instagram page. They've got so many great services right now for families who are feeling the weight of this stress. Um, it's a great starting point for a family that's worried not only about violence against women, but also, you know, abuse of children in a very stressed home. Well, I'd like to thank you, ladies. Uh, I don't see any further questions and uh, we're about at an hour and a half. So, Thank you for your time. I hope that we can re-engage in another, because obviously this pandemic is, you know, it's not gonna go away for a little while, because you know, every country is handling it in a different way. I think we're, we're handling it in, a, I think, a pretty responsible way to try to stop the spread. And so, um, like you said, I think, um, you know, mental health issues will, will not go away even when the pandemic may be under control. But uh, I'd like to invite all of you back. Thank Shannon for your presentation. Thank Felicia and thank Pauline. Uh, thank you for joining us on the call. And um, again, this, this webinar will be posted to the Chamber's website, uh, chambercovidupdates.ky. And again, thank you ladies for participating in this, in this call and addressing the topic. Thank you for having thank us. You. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Hope everyone has a good day. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.